Welcome to Econ Talk from the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of George Mason University, and today we're podcasting from the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. For more Econ Talk and additional readings and links related to this podcast, visit econtalk.org. My guest is Robert Barrow, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Paul M. Warburg Professor of Economics at Harvard University. He's written numerous books and articles on macroeconomics, monetary theory, and economic growth. Robert, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks. Glad to be here. Well, in recent years, you've become very interested in economic growth. How has the economics profession's view of growth changed over the years since you've been a professional economist? I suppose in general, there's been a shift in the view that markets are more important. This is not particularly economic growth, but it certainly comes up in the growth context. Also, more recently, there's more stress on the role of uh, institutions, uh, legal systems, political corruption, uh, effects like that in terms of influencing economic growth. Factors that in years past would be seen as having being outside economics. Yes, exactly. I, I think the older work focused on some narrow economic concepts, things like saving rates, uh, rates of population growth, levels of technology. So partly uh, the profession has... Uh, incorporated those elements, but also gone uh, to additional ones, which are less narrowly uh, economic in some sense. In the, in the early days, meaning the early days, say, of the, of the last century, uh, there was a big focus on capital. And the implication was that if you had more capital, you'd grow faster. Uh, is that a good summary of the state of the art for, for a while in the middle of the, the 1950s and 60s? I don't think there was something wrong with the growth theory of the 1950s, the so-called neoclassical uh, growth model due to Bob Solow Mm -hmm. and some other uh, prominent economists. Uh, I think it is right that uh, investment is important. Uh, Accumulating capital, I think, is important. And accumulating human capital is perhaps uh, at least as important as as physical capital. I I think the insights from those models are good ones. And the framework provided uh, from those models uh, is good. But I think we've gone uh, also beyond that, supplementing in terms of the uh, forces that matter. And thinking also a lot about uh, certain convergence questions, which is particularly about whether poor economies tend in some regular way to catch up to rich ones. I think that's a particularly uh, compelling question that you can consider within that framework. In the early days, people thought there'd be this natural convergence, right? That the, the poor countries would have higher rates of return, capital would flow into those countries, and that would mean they would grow faster, the richer economies would grow slower, and it would be only a matter of time before Nigeria had the standard of living in the United States. It didn't turn out that way, though. Yeah, clearly there are a lot of disappointments along those lines. I think the convergence force is nevertheless uh, important, but it's also important to inquire into what offset that. So we didn't see the Nigerias uh, catching up in the way that you just uh, described. And I think we've learned that uh, many economies like that were doing things very badly with respect to institutions, uh, rule of law, uh, with respect to uh, other features about education systems and such that uh, didn't function uh, terribly well. Presumably stuff that we called investment or that we measured as capital weren't really productive often because of those missing elements. Yeah, I think that that's a force. Uh, If you think about the African countries as a whole, uh, one of the counsels from the 1960s was that we needed a lot more education, human capital in that sense. Uh, At least as we measure schooling uh, in a way that you can get data, such as years of education, that's uh, more or less doubled in most of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa since the 1960s, and the results have been quite uh, disappointing. Uh, I think part of that's because the quality of that uh, human capital wasn't really very good, and um, you weren't really getting the human capital in, in, in the relevant sense uh, as an input to production. Is there also an issue there of the skills that they were acquiring weren't re- relevant for the economies they were they found themselves in? It's a strange that, problem, but it seems some people say that's a problem. That's a possibility. I don't know that anybody's identified that uh, specifically. I think there was, uh, in some economies in that region, Originally, there was a small group that was getting pretty good secondary education, and then it shifted to being actually more egalitarian. And maybe that didn't work so well in terms of uh, productivity, that kind of a shift. But I think also the quality of education uh, in many poor countries, particularly in Africa, uh, diminished over time. And, of course, we have a very blunt instrument for measuring it. Years of schooling obviously doesn't tell you 
which is what we often have in a data set, when we try to measure the impact of schooling on growth, here's a schooling is doesn't tell you whether it was any good, whether they just you could just sit there and look at a wall, it didn't mean you acquired any any valuable knowledge. I think that's right. And then other places we have some uh, better measures based on international test scores, uh, particularly on uh, exams in science, mathematics, and reading. And those measures turn out to have a lot more explanatory power for economic growth than the ones based on years of uh, school attainment. And I think it's just a better measure of uh, human capital, the ones based on test scores. Uh, we don't have those data for nearly as many countries or, or years, but to the extent that we have them, it looks like it's more important. So in a way, that's heartening because it does suggest that education that uh, is channeled properly actually could matter a lot for productivity uh, and growth. We also know something about health. Uh, some indicators of health seem actually to have more explanatory power for subsequent growth than the ones that we have about uh, education. Explain. Well, you can see why being healthy might contribute to worker productivity, um, reducing absenteeism and just uh, increasing productivity on the job, uh, for example. And the broad indicators that we have, things about life expectancy and uh, infant mortality and such, do seem to have some explanatory power. The places that succeed, for example, in raising uh, life expectancy, that seems to contribute to subsequent uh, economic growth. And you don't think that's just causation running the other direction? Nations with higher economic growth have longer life expectancy, lower infant mortality. Can we, can we successfully test that statistically, do you think? That issue arises uh, throughout this kind of uh, study. And certainly there's reverse causation from economic uh, prosperity to, as you mentioned, life expectancy, but also to things like uh, even schooling, sure. uh, quality of institutions. You have that issue uh, throughout. Uh, the data do at least suggest that if you hold constant things like the initial level of per capita GDP and education and such, that there's some indication that prior years of life expectancy predict future economic growth. So it's a little bit of an indicator of causation, but I wouldn't push it that far. You're right. That, that, that's the most serious problem in empirical economics always yeah. in terms of uh, figuring out the causation. Let's talk about technology. In, in recent years, there's been a big focus on the role of technology and growth. I think if you went and talked to the man or woman on the street about why our standard of living is higher than it was 100 years ago or why it's higher than it was 50 years ago, I think most people would say technology. I'm not sure they understand exactly what they mean by that in terms of its impact on growth. Um, but the profession, has, the economics profession, has looked at technology in a very specific way in, in recent years. Tell us a little bit about that. So there are a few aspects of that. I mean, technological progress was thought, even in the earlier models from the 50s, to be a key long-run driver of per capita uh, economic growth. And then, especially toward the end of the 1980s, 1990s, the beginning of it, uh, there were more theoretical advances about how technological progress might arise and why it would contribute uh, to growth. Uh, the diffusion of technology across countries was thought to be another uh, big supporter of convergence because the poor countries didn't really have to invent things uh, themselves. They could imitate the things that had been discovered by the leaders. The process actually seemed to work quite well for some of the followers, like Japan, uh, later South Korea, and some other Asian economies, but not working so well for the uh, countries that are currently the poorest, again, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. How much do you think of that do you think is institutional versus uh, a set of incentives that are in place. So, for example, I mean, it's hard to understand, right? You have, in America, we have all these wonderful technologies, but, of course, in some very poor countries, it's not rational to adopt those technologies because of, say, the cost of labor. And the famous example is a garbage truck. In America, garbage is collected with basically one person driving in a very, very high-tech piece of capital that's able to pick up a garbage can and, and lift it up over the truck and drop it in. Sometimes the second person, I think, who's there to make sure the can doesn't fall over or keep people from running into the truck. But in poorer countries, there, it wouldn't be rational to use that truck because of low cost of labor. And so they use a very primitive form of capital with lots of labor. So the capital-labor ratio is very different. That would be one reason, perhaps, why poor countries wouldn't attract, wouldn't use the technology that's already out there. The second reason might be uh, the system doesn't reward profit 
doesn't reward risk taking, and so uh, adopting technologies often you might get those technologies might get take you know the devices might get taken from you. They're not secure. The profits you get from them might not be secure. Do you have any thoughts on on that? Yeah, I think those last issues you mentioned are particularly critical in explaining why some countries don't catch up. I think the institutional setting gets reflected in terms of prices and markets and incentives. Uh, tends to be especially a difficulty in, uh, again, especially African countries, but also uh, some Latin American countries that have a great deal of trouble in terms of uh, uh, catching up, in terms of sustaining uh, economic growth. Um, there is a recent study showing that uh, the rate of return on capital is actually similar if you look uh, across countries. It was thought to be a puzzle that the rate of return on capital was very high in poor countries related to this convergence idea, and therefore why didn't they have a big flow of capital in and a lot of investment and growth. But then this recent study suggests that uh, if you look at the actual returns, uh, they're similar in different countries. They tend to be equilibrated, which you might expect through some kind of international market mechanism. It's not that people are missing big return opportunities. But the reason the returns aren't so high in uh, a lot of the developing poor countries is precisely because of some of these institutional problems and uh, other problems in messing up the price system. Um, For example, capital is often very expensive in poor countries because of uh, government policies. Uh, People worrying about property rights is another uh, central issue. So if you factor all of that in and then you look at what the returns are uh, in the end, it doesn't look like there are these big rates of return in poor countries that are not being exploited. So then you have to ask, what is it in terms of institutional or other policy changes uh, that could be made, which would then be reflected in raising these rates of return? And then uh, if you did that, then I think you could be pretty confident that the investment flows would follow uh, on from that. If you look over the last 20 or so years, there's been a great deal of increase in global trade in certain parts of the world and other parts of the world, Africa being the most obvious example. Uh, trade has not uh, been as dramatic in, in part of the African economies as it has been in Asia and in Latin America. Those of us who are uh, who think that free trade is a good thing often point to the rising living standards of the nations that have expanded their trade. And yet, something of a caveat perhaps, a lot of the gains in standard of living over the last 20, 30 years are driven, if you look globally, by a handful of countries, it appears, China and India being the most dramatic examples. If you take China and India out, do you have a feeling that the standard of living around the world is climbing for most nations other than those who are disconnected from the trading system? Well, let me say some general things about trade and free trade. I mean, I subscribe to the usual view of most economists that... uh, Free trade is a good idea. I think the arguments for that go back several centuries as to why uh, free trade would maximize uh, what you could produce with given uh, inputs, basically. Uh, Comparative advantage type arguments. Uh, Free trade is also useful from the standpoint of international competition uh, and could be expected to increase productivity and promote growth on, uh, on those grounds. Empirically, I mean, freer trade, which is one of the components of freer markets, looks like it's a positive for economic growth, but it's frankly not nearly as strong as I would expect uh, if you look at it empirically. You look at measures of how uh, open economies are uh, to international trade, either by looking at the actual trade flows or or some measures of uh, restrictiveness on trade, uh, quotas and tariffs in particular. Uh, you get some explanatory power from that, but frankly less than I would have uh, predicted. Uh, so it looks like a positive, and certainly free trade looks like a good policy uh, uh, thing that governments can actually accomplish and, uh, and would be uh, have some return, but not as much as I would uh, predict. Um, China and India have been doing really well. Uh, they didn't always do well. I mean, China's been doing well since the late 70s and India, somewhat in the 80s, and particularly at the beginning of the 1990s, has been doing better. I don't, I, I don't know that international trade is the biggest reason, certainly not for India's uh, growth. I wouldn't have... Uh, I, I think it's an element, but I, I'm not sure that... 
Uh, if you were looking across the world for places where international trade has played the biggest role, uh, I, I don't know that China and India would, would be the, the only ones you, you would look at. And I'm also thinking about capital flows, though. And, and you know, we're talking about these equilibrating rates of return. A lot of capital has flowed into both those countries, obviously, and driven a lot of the global measured gains in, in standard of living. But even if I... My yeah, suspicion earlier is, that was... Yeah. My suspicion is even if you took those out, you'd still see some significant growth in lots of countries. Yeah, and the places that sort of support the idea that free trade encourages growth, that doesn't really depend on the inclusion of China and India in the sample, sure. I, I, even though they would be consistent to, consistent with that view. Um, of course, now those countries are more uh, shifted towards surplus positions, and the interesting thing is they're accumulating so much uh, in the way of asset claims on the U.S., so it's uh, changed a bit. Um, if you're looking at kind of the change in the global standard of living and the income distribution and things like that, I, d I don't think you really want to take China and India out of that picture because it's a third of the world's <laughs> population. I mean, for some purposes, for scientific inquiry, it's not too bad to weight countries more or less equally in right. terms of what information do you get about what matters. But if you want to look at the results and what's happened, uh, then it's crazy, of course, to, to throw those out. And then the idea that uh, poverty has been decreased a lot and even income inequality diminished, uh, China and India are central to that answer. It's because of the strong growth in those two countries that you get this dramatic reduction in world poverty over the last 25 years or so, and also some movement away from uh, income inequality. You wouldn't get that if you just looked at countries in an even way. But I think from a perspective of world population, thinking about persons, you wouldn't want to wait it that way. So. Yeah, the reason I was thinking about it is that you do a lot of global cross-section analysis across a wide range of countries, and I'm sure some of your critics, especially the non-economists, but I, I presume some economists as well, would say, oh, you can't do that. You can't look, you can't lump all these countries together. Each one's a special case. They've got their own institutions, their own peculiarities, their own religious issues, their own ethics, culture, Etc. And so to just lump them together crudely, it's just it's a meaningless result. And yet, you find lots of regularities across those cultures, across those countries. And I assume that some people would just say, "Well, you know, India and China are driving a lot of those results," but they're not. A lot of interesting results that are across countries, I assume. Without so there are a lot of different things in that <laughs> yeah, in that question. Um, so China and India certainly weren't driving the results that I was looking at because, in fact, the main results I have done Tell us were those. weighting countries more or less evenly because, I say, from the standpoint of learning about economic relationships, it is almost true that the small countries and the big countries tell you uh, something similar. Sure. Um, so as a mechanical statement, it's not true that the big countries were at all driving uh, those results. The differences of across countries, in fact, are what make it it's interesting to pull them together because then you get more variation in the policies and institutions that you think might matter for growth. Or more recently, I've been looking at some cultural factors like religious differences. And the only way you can explore those, of course, is by looking at places that are very different to see you know, what is the consequence of those differences. So the fact that they are very different is not at all, I think, a criticism of, of pooling that information. I think, in fact, it goes the other way. There are a couple of quotes from people that may be relevant to this. Uh, I know Gary Becker once said something like, uh, there's only one economics. Uh, I think he was thinking about that, particularly in terms of uh, kind of economic theory and whether macroeconomics was different from microeconomics. And he was sorry, saying there's only, only one way to think about economics. But I think he would also apply that to thinking about uh, economic relationships in different places. People respond to incentives regardless of... Yeah, there. yeah, and, and institutions, uh, they're not the same, but the way they matter is sort of the, the same. And um, Bob Lucas said something kind of similar to Becker. He said something uh, to the effect that basically countries are all the same. <laughs> he didn't mean that they were the same in terms of the position of uh, economic development, but again, he meant in terms of thinking about incentives and the way people react to changes, that there's a sameness in, in that in terms of uh, uh, humanity, if you like. And that by exploiting that, by looking at all these different uh, experiences, you really uh, gain insight into the central forces that matter uh, anywhere.
Well, let's go. Let's go back to your work in particular. Tell us about some of the findings that do hold across countries and, and that are important for explaining economic growth. So, two sets of things. Um, one is that if you hold constant a lot of these forces that matter, which I can list some in a moment, uh, things about saving behavior and institutions and uh, government policies, if you hold all that constant, you do get back to this convergence idea, which uh, was introduced by the kind of model that came from the 1950s, the so-called neoclassical growth model. So there's a conditional sense in which it is true that poor places catch up. And one way to look at that is to say that if a poor country, such as in sub-Saharan Africa, can get things in order with respect to its institutions, uh, with respect to some other variables, which I can uh, discuss some of them, then it is the case that being behind means you can catch up rapidly. And of course, we see some examples of countries that kind of get things in shape and then catch up rapidly, like if you think about uh, some of the East Asian countries since uh, the late 1950s, early 1960s, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, for example, Japan starting a bit earlier. Uh, Those countries were initially quite poor at some of these years, but my interpretation is that they sort of got things reasonable in terms of policies, institutions, and then they could grow very fast and catch up so that's sort of the hopeful side of thinking about African countries, that you could say if you could ever get it right in terms of some of these underlying policies, then it is possible to grow fast and catch up. The unhopeful side would be, so why don't they do that? Two theories being that they don't realize it, the second being their political constraints, presumably that thugs like keeping as much as they can and some of these institutions spread stuff too widely perhaps, I don't know. Right. So I think some of those are critical issues. So there's two steps to that, too, I think. So one, if we think about institutions, for example, uh, the extent to which you have something like rule of law governing uh, behavior or the extent to which you have a lot of uh, corruption in government, uh, extent to which you have functioning uh, markets allowed to operate, those kinds of things. So one question is, what is the impact of different institutions, different market setups? And I think we know something about that. But then the second thing would be, what is it that determines whether the institutions are good or bad, uh, or whether markets are allowed to function? That gets into something that's often called political economy in terms of the way governments operate and such. And I think there's a lot of research going on in that, but it's a complex topic. I don't think we really uh, know all of that. Uh, On the first part, I think we do know some things about uh, qualities of institutions and markets that matter for things like economic growth. Um, So I think better respect for property rights, uh, functioning legal systems, the judiciary, things sometimes called rule of law. Uh, I think those... Enforceable contracts. Enforceable contracts, yes. Those things seem to be important to contribute both to investment and economic growth. And then you can say, well, then why don't, say, a a typical African country do that? Why don't they put these things in place? Well, it seems to be, in fact, difficult to put things in place. And it also may be the case that the incentives of political leaders is not for doing that, particularly if they're mainly concerned with uh, theft or uh, maximizing their own individual interests. Sometimes that will conflict with these uh, policies. This is more in this political economy line. But at a minimum, we certainly shouldn't be following policies that encourage uh, theft or discourage the creation of markets. And I feel sometimes our aid is um, doesn't create the right incentives. Yeah, it's been argued that foreign aid often promotes corruption. Uh, it makes the government more important, particularly in terms of distributing the funds, and it makes it more important uh, how you are reacting to international agencies, for example, that are distributing the money might be the World Bank or the IMF or the UN, or it might be some big country like the United States or France or something like that. Uh, So the evidence overall is that foreign aid doesn't seem to be very growth-promoting. And uh, I think that's because it's not the idea that having cash per se is the thing that's uh, inhibiting growth in the first place. It's more about incentives to set up proper uh, functioning institutions and and markets. so as a, as a um, 
we'll come back to growth in a second, but we're all on this issue of promoting growth outside the United States. Um, what advice, what should, a, what should be the United States policy with respect to poor nations around the world? You're a little bit skeptical, it sounds like, about the role of, of free trade, although you say that'll help if they move toward a, a free trade. I think particularly in nations that are particularly at one end of the spectrum, the help might be quite a bit larger than for the United States moving toward free trade. Um, the aid that we've given has perhaps been counterproductive, but it certainly hasn't been terribly productive. What what would you encourage the United States to do or the so-called developed nations with respect to the rest of the poor nations? Well, free trade is certainly something I would uh, advocate. Uh, in the context of poor countries, it's especially significant to be reducing the barriers on the kinds of products that they would naturally be engaging in with respect to uh, exports. And a lot of that is agricultural products. So some of that, of course, is being heavily discussed now. Yeah. And it's especially involving reducing protection from the rich countries that are most active in uh, inhibiting imports of uh, agricultural products. Disgusting. It's partly the U.S., but the European yeah. Union is even worse. Uh, so the U.S. government has, in has uh, indicated some willingness to have some major change in this. I don't know whether politically it's uh, serious uh, the EU has indicated less of an interest, but they've claimed to be willing to do something. Uh, uh, but that would be a very positive uh, factor. Um, this is very active in this Doha round. This is, the, I think, the issue that's really preventing anything from much uh, going forward. Uh, earlier, Brazil is actually taking the lead in arguing that there should be this massive reduction in uh, agricultural imports. And, Often I'm not such a fan of things that Brazil says. Uh, Brazil, for example, makes it very difficult for Americans to go over there as uh, visitors because of their visa requirements. But I thought they were just right on this issue. They were really arguing that the rich countries had to uh, massively reduce their barriers to trade in agricultural products. So I think that that's a relatively easy thing because you don't need some elaborate institutional structure to take advantage of uh, free trade. So I think that that's a sort of clear thing. I mentioned that health was a very important uh, predictor of economic growth, and it's especially a problem in some uh, sub-Saharan African countries. So you could think that improvements in health, investments there might be very productive. Uh, some of the world uh, philanthropy now is particularly in that direction, such as from the Gates Foundation, and got all this money now from Warren Buffett too, apparently. Maybe that will turn out to be more productive than the usual foreign aid thing. I've been somewhat uh, skeptical, but uh, at least it's focusing on an issue which if there were improvement, it could matter for overall growth. There are some good ideas, such as from my colleague Michael Creamer at Harvard, about how you could specifically direct uh, investment uh, in the health area that would be helpful for uh, developing countries. Things like uh, certain kinds of vaccinations and uh, Clean water is Clean water. A, another important thing, and uh, uh, it, it's a possibility that that would be much more useful than the usual type of uh, foreign aid. Building you know, a new steel plant, for example? Yeah, that hasn't proved too yeah. successful in uh, Nigeria or some other African countries. We, we got no, I, I think, One thing about the Gates thing, though, I should yeah. say, it's often put like he's supposed to be giving back to society <laughs> somehow which I find completely uh, mystical. I mean, the guy's obviously been very successful, and I think what he's contributed to society is much more than what he's gotten individually. I sure hope so. so I, think I don't see him breaking into people's houses at night and taking <laughs> stuff from them. They seem to buy his products voluntarily. They do complain about him from time to time. But, but I think there was a great social surplus from his uh, activities and what he was really good at, which was apparently something about computer software. It's not malaria? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I don't necessarily translate that into him being good at this business of doing international uh, aid. But maybe he's much better than the usual UN bureaucrat or uh, World Bank person. So who knows? It's possible. And it's very interesting that Warren Buffett would decide that that's the best way he should give his resources. But That was rather remarkable, really. I'm not quite sure what that's about. Yeah. Well, the social surplus from Buffett's activities are Enormous. much less transparent yeah, but still, I think, than, uh, than Gates, but uh, in any case. 
But we got distracted from our earlier discussion. You were trying to identify some of the other factors that you discovered empirically as being important. So uh, in terms of a generalization, I think one has a sense of a whole package of policies, institutions that matter, and it gets more difficult, I think, to be precise about the details of exactly which ones matter. So things that look like pro-market forces, I think, tend to be positive. But then some of that is about free international trade, which we've talked about. Some is about, about what are tax rates and regulatory policies. I think we have a sense that overall things that look like pro-market policies tend to foster economic growth. But in terms of the data and in terms of the statistical uh, procedures that we can use, I think it's hard to be exactly precise. Uh, I think investment in the sort of standard sense uh, actually looks like a positive. That's what uh, would have been focused on in the models of the 1950s. Um, Human capital we've already discussed. I've said some things about health. talked about education and the things we know that are positive and the ones that are less uh, clear-cut. If you look at something like government consumption overall, it looks like it's a negative. And of course, it tends also to be accompanied by taxes, which tend to be uh, discouraging of economic activity uh, along the lines of these uh, market forces. It looks like high fertility rates, which underlie high population growth, are somewhat of a negative, but not maybe the most important uh, uh, force. Again, there's an example where causation might run the other way. Hard to tease out those effects. Yeah, it's definitely the case that uh, uh, in the data we see, particularly in the post-World War II period, that as countries become richer, the fertility rates tend to go down. Um, So that's the reverse direction that you were just... uh, Referring to the correspondence between China and India is interesting in that uh, context. Uh, India had pretty high fertility rates, but they've been coming down now uh, as uh, per capita income has been rising, particularly since uh, the 1980s in India. Um, China has somewhat of a different pattern. Uh, Some of it is like that, being richer, they uh, are reducing fertility rates. But they also had this active one-child policy, which you can see in the data did reduce fertility below what you would have expected at each level of per capita income that you've seen going back to the mid-1970s. So so it it has a sort of kick to lower fertility than you would have predicted, but then it also has this time pattern of steadily declining fertility as the uh, per capita income is increasing. So I think that will continue, although China now seems to be uh, probably relaxing the one-child policy. I think they're moving in that uh, direction. You mentioned earlier savings rate. A lot of people wring their hands over the U.S. savings rate as being too low or negative. Can you comment on that? Well, what matters in terms of growth is the overall investment. So if we're talking here about physical investment, if you look at the ratio of that uh, measure to gross domestic product, it's not really low in in the U.S. It's something on the order of 17% now, this ratio of gross investment to the uh, GDP, which is actually pretty high in an historical sense for the U.S. And uh, that seems to be more than adequate for explaining growth. And one factor that magnifies that is that it appears that there's been um, great quality improvements on the side of uh, capital goods of various types, uh, Computers may be being the most important, but uh, also in other areas. So the kind of real investment that we're getting out of this 17% ratio is actually much higher now than it was 15 years ago. Uh, if, we, if we have a 17% ratio today and something similar to that 15 years ago, what we're contributing to the accumulation of real capital and hence to growth is actually much more. Because we don't uh, measure the improvements in the quality accurately, is that why? Well, we're measuring some of it and some of it we're not, but the 17% is a ratio of nominal uh, investment, is the dollars that we're spending on capital goods relative to dollars of gross domestic product. So that's before we even try to measure uh, the quality of that. Then, to some extent, we're, we're measuring the quality, and what that shows up in is a reduction in the relative price of capital goods compared to consumables, or compared to the overall GDP. And in terms of the published data, that's actually quite uh, pronounced, particularly since the early 90s. There's been a real reduction uh, in the relative price of capital goods. So that means if we're uh, 
if we have something like an overall saving rate, it's not exactly the saving rate, but uh, close to it of 17%, forgetting about the current account imbalance, that would be roughly the saving rate. So if we're saving 17% of our dollars of income, the real capital that we're getting out of that is really much greater than you would think because of this reduction in the price of uh, capital input of given quality. So some of that actually is now captured in the measured price data, and maybe it's even still underestimated because we don't uh, do so well in gauging the quality of some types. There's been a lot of improvement in that, uh, though, over time. Uh, for example, in computers, uh, automobiles, things like that. And there are some proposals now for doing that in the health area, but it hasn't really been implemented uh, so much. Are you worried yet. about the um, current account deficit? Well, so I, I was saying I wasn't worried about the overall saving uh, performance right. and related to that, the investment uh, as underlying the growth. And in fact, growth has been pretty good lately, and uh, a lot of that is productivity growth, which I think relates to some of the factors I was uh, describing. The current account balance, I don't know whether to be worried about it, or, but I certainly am puzzled uh, about it, because it is true that the current account balance is staggering in relation to the U.S. history, just in terms of the numbers. The average of the ratio of the current account deficit to GDP has been uh, something like 5% for five or six years. And if you look at the previous 200 years, you don't see numbers like that. Uh, the whole period, uh, 1815 is the closest, uh, but the data aren't too good for 1815. Those are very good years. Well, the early 18 right, right after the war of 1812. <laughs> yeah, so it's hard to distinguish those two factors. But, but, I'm, yeah. but I'm saying the numbers really are quite unprecedented. Um, the fiscal deficit is no big deal. The budget deficit in the U.S. is no big deal, and it's actually getting pretty close to zero now. But the current account deficit is very different from that, and it really is very large historically. Now, I don't know whether that's disturbing, because I, my first instinct is to think of this as some kind of market equilibrium, even if I don't understand why sure. it came out this way. So people have made some proposals like, why it is that the rest of the world wants to be accumulating a lot of uh, claims on the U.S., uh, many of which are in the form of U.S. government bonds. Um, but not, it's not a, a majority of the claims, right? It's, it's an incredible thing, really, that coming back to our earlier discussion about rates of return on capital and convergence, that the United States remains such an attractive place to invest for foreign uh, investors. I guess we'd want to make a distinction between foreign investors as individuals and foreign governments that are buying those those treasury bonds, or would you? Well, on the margin, a lot of it is in the form of this relatively liquid stuff like U.S. Treasury paper. It's certainly very much of a minority if you look at the gross amount of claims held by foreigners on, on the U.S. Now, you say the U.S. is relatively very attractive, and I guess that must be true in the sense that somehow there's a demand for this stuff. But they certainly don't see that in terms of rates of return. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The rate of return that the U.S. has been getting on its foreign claims has been much higher than the rate of return that foreigners have been getting on U.S. claims. And because of that, the net flow of receipts has still been in the favor of the U.S. It's a shocking result. Explain that a little bit. Right? We're supposed to be running this big deficit, and yet the, the flow of funds into the United States... The sort of the dividends and capital gains are worse coming in than it's going out, correct? Right. Just hard to understand. <laughs> so there really has been a big current account deficit. And in terms of the estimates, what does that mean about the stock of the net indebtedness? So the U.S. is now in debt to the rest of the world by about 25% of U.S. GDP, something like that. So that's historically well, When you say in debt, though, some of that includes... Real productive assets, factories, companies, you know, equity, etc. Right? It's not. It's not so this is supposed borrowing. to be a comprehensive measure, which includes uh, U.S. claims on uh, could be foreign stocks, could be direct ownership of U.S. businesses abroad, so direct foreign investment in a, by U.S. in the other countries. It could be holdings of foreign bonds, uh, currencies, etc. And then you net that out against all the comparable foreign claims on the U.S. And the Bureau of Economic Analysis in the U.S. Commerce Department has been trying harder to measure this thing more accurately, trying to get market values of all these things, uh, subject to rough estimates, particularly 
for things that look like direct business claims that are not traded on financial markets. That's subject right. to a lot of error. Tempting to say it's just a wild guess, but it, they're, doing, they're doing the best they can. Yeah, so that's the number that looks like minus 25% of U.S. GDP now. So that's sort of the snapshot position at a point in time of, of the net debt. Now, you would have predicted that since we were net in debt that the flow of income on all this stuff should be against the U.S., but in fact, it's still uh, in favor of the U.S. and hasn't really changed that much for the last five or six years while we had this big imbalance. It's, it's plus a little bit in favor of the U.S. So one theory is now, it's just a mismeasure, right, the stock. But the other theory is the one you mentioned, that we're just investing in high – Americans invest in higher return assets overseas versus what foreigners are investing in here, right? Well, mechanically, that is what's in the data because mechanically the only way it can work out – uh, given the estimates of the various categories of assets being held by the U.S. abroad and vice versa, uh, it's that the rate of return has been much higher. Now, part of that is that the foreigners are holding much more uh, low-risk things. Stable, stable uh, stuff. U.S. Treasury paper being particularly paramount in this regard. And the U.S. is holding more particularly uh, stuff that looks like direct investment uh, uh, in companies abroad. Uh, so one argument about why the whole imbalance is not such a problem is that the U.S. is really good at managing this stuff that's held abroad, ownership of companies, uh, running stuff. And really, if you valued that properly, uh, we wouldn't be in so much debt. But the way it shows up now is that you're, we're getting a high return on a smaller stock in that category. And then people are concerned that, uh, for example, the Chinese and the Japanese and other Asian countries in particular are accumulating all this treasury paper. Ooh. And we're worried, some people are worried about are they going to be willing to do that forever? And if not, there's going to have to be some kind of adjustment. Uh, what would they do? I've never understood this, this worry. If they don't want to hold them, suppose they changed their mind. They realized, they said, you know, yeah. all these years we thought this was a good idea. It's not. They've got it. They've, they're still holding it. They're going to have to sell it. Yeah, drive the price down? I mean, what would be the harm to us? It would be all harm to them, it seems to me. Or am I missing something? Well, I agree with a lot of that, because I'm, I agree in the sense that I think the market will handle this if the governments don't do something stupid to try to fix the problem. So some of that might involve adjustments of exchange rates and interest rates, and uh, other flows will adjust. On the other hand, it clearly is a good deal for the U.S. if foreigners are willing to accumulate all this paper essentially say that there's a big uh, uh, implicit yield from treasury paper, which is like an export for the U.S. It's like we can export services from this uh, kind of treasury liquidity. And that actually is good for our real income because that means we're producing something that has value and then we can get stuff like Chinese textiles in exchange for that. So that's good. And then if other people decide that this uh, liquidity service is not so great... That actually is harmful. That actually will reduce our real income because then we're not producing something. Evidently, uh, right. So actually, it is a good thing for us if they are willing to hold the stuff. And even though I agree that the markets will adjust, I don't see a crisis. Uh, it might reduce our real income in a full sense if there is this change in uh, demand. So what you're suggesting really is that the stability of our political system and the relative stability of our economic system and I meaning rel relatively low inflation, relatively low risk of um, lost returns due to inflation, that that's a, a, we get a premium for being able to create that and capture textiles and other things from around the world because people are willing to hold our assets because they're secure and stable. Puzzles, there's a lot of competition from other nations that are, Seem pretty good at it. Yeah. Is France and England and Germany, just to take three obvious examples, or is it just that the dollar is special, that people I, like it, it's comfortable? It's I agree that worldwide. that's a puzzle. If you look at the uh, inflation experience and monetary policy more broadly, the U.S. has been very good since uh, mid 1980s, a little earlier, but not noticeably better than a lot of other advanced uh, countries. It looked instead like there was a general kind of technological shift with respect to monetary policy, and central bankers learned how to do it right. better than they used to. Uh, 
It's not so much that the U.S. took the lead, although I think Volcker in the early 80s was quite important in terms of uh, ending the inflation that had built up. But it was really other countries that took the lead in terms of some of the modern uh, central banking monetary policy, uh, starting actually with New Zealand in 1989 or so. But then today other countries, uh, including uh, the U.K. with the Bank of England and uh, um, some other nations, uh, Canada being another example, actually seem to perform better than the U.S. with respect to maintaining low and stable inflation. So although the U.S. has been very good, I don't think it's really an outlier with respect to the rich countries. Maybe so then like I the agree with the puzzle that you said. The dollar clearly has a special role uh, in the world economy, financial economy especially, that goes beyond this thing about this uh, inflation stability. Maybe they just like the pictures on the... <laughs> well, we're out of time. My guest today has been Robert Barrow, professor of economics at Harvard University and a senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. I want to close this podcast with a puzzle for you, the listener. I joked about foreigners holding American treasury notes because they like the pictures. Back when I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, we used to ponder the following exam question which actually deals with the same underlying economic issues. An American tourist goes to a remote island for a vacation. The natives there live by a barter system. They don't have any money or medium of exchange. When the tourist tries to pay for his lodging with a check, the owner laughs at first, but then decides that the design on the check is quite attractive and agrees to accept the check in return for lodging. This happens again when the tourist pays for food and some native artwork. The whole vacation goes like that. The tourist gets goods and services and pays with his checks. The checks are never cashed. Eventually, they begin to circulate on the island as money, a medium of exchange, replacing the barter system that had existed before. The question for the students and the question for you, the listener, is this. If the checks are never cashed, who pays for the vacation of the tourist? Or is it free? You can give your answers at econtalk.org in the comments section for this podcast. You can also find more podcasts there and links to additional readings. I'm Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening.